Hi, welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, and I'm here with the Center for Hellenic Studies and Out of Chaos Theater and a pretty amazing cast of people to bring you your, a, an adaptation of Euripides Cyclops. It's a rock opera. Um, it's pretty much the most exciting thing I've been looking forward to this month, maybe even this year. Um, so our special guest today is Carl Shaw, who's the one of the few masters in the world of the Seder play. Um, and we have our special guests who've put on the performance, uh, um, Rob Castell, uh, Chaz Libretto, Jay Landon Marcus, and Paul Omani. And uh, several of these figures are important, are um, credited with creating this play. Um, and if you go to chazlibretto.com forward slash Cyclops dash two, which will hopefully get under the, the video for you, you can follow along with the script that we'll be using because it's an adaptation from the original book. So this week we bring you at the only full surviving satyr play from ancient Athens, Euripides' Cyclops. During the tragic competition, poets would stage a trilogy followed by a satyr play, um, some type of vaudevillian satire tragedy itself. We don't know as much about satyr plays as we'd like to, Carl fortunately knows a lot, um, but from the surviving example, we can see some of the extreme bodily humor of comedy combined with tragedies, mythical figures and themes. Of course, comedy is about excess. And in this reading of the story, Odysseus' encounter with Polyphemus, um, we're adding our own excess by bringing back the music and words from Cyclops, a rock opera. Um, I don't know if the small screen is ready for this one, um, but we're ready to sort of pump some life and some uh, horror uh, into the small screen of Reading Greek Tragedy Online. Um, so Carl, I'm delighted that you're here today uh, because I think you know, you're one of a handful of people who write on Seder plays um, almost exclusively and you've written on this play. Um, so can you start us out um, by correcting some of my misconceptions and really sort of giving us an idea of what a Seder, a Seder play is and what it does. And you, yeah, you're muted, Carl. Let's see if we can fix that problem. Uh, mute, unmute. <laughs> and you're waiting. While Carl figures it out, uh, maybe I'll stall for a bit. Can you try talking, Carl? <laughs> so the technology part of the play is perhaps um, not what we were intending. Um, all right, we may have to audible on the line, on the line for this one. Uh, Carl, you want to try logging in, logging out, logging back in, and seeing if that helps, um, and we can get some of your volume. So um, one of the most interesting things about this Seder play um, is that it's based on one of the most famous scenes in ancient Greek epic. Um, and that is that moment when Odysseus ends up on the Cyclops' island and has this famous exchange with the Cyclops. All right, and Polyphemus um, is well known, of course, from myth for being this giant figure, for being um, the son of Poseidon so, who uh, curses um, Odysseus. Um, and so at this moment, Carl, who is still trying. So what this play does is it takes this most famous of engagements into interactions um, and sort of flips it by adding a few extra characters. It adds Silenus, um, who's one of the satyrs and his children, an entire sort of cast of characters um, who makes things run a little wild. Um, and uh, then he sort of plays on the motifs that we already know. So you get some of the most famous moments from the Odyssey flipped on end. And what we have to remember is that these moments aren't just from the Odyssey. They're from other plays and from Seder plays um, where we get to explore this most famous moment of Odysseus's uh, Kleos um, when he um, overcomes uh, the Cyclops to get his homecoming. Um, so this is probably a um, pretty famous way, uh, sorry, a pretty typical way that Greek tragedy start uh, was transformed into Seder plays. So what I'd like to do um, if, if Carl is back here, can, and it says you're connecting to audio, Carl, um, is uh, invite some of the creators to come on. Um, so Chas, if you, if you would sort of uh, log in, if you're there, um, turn your video on. Um, so what brought you to this play for your creation? Well, uh, 
I was invited to uh, the Getty Villa about 10 years ago. Uh, there was like a symposium and uh, kind of a collection of the largest, I guess, assembly of uh, theater vases or vases that, kind of, that scholars thought were depicting performances of ancient Greek plays um, uh, that Mary Louise Hart had organized. And Norman Frisch, who worked there, uh, invited me to a symposium where a number of scholars and theater practitioners were uh, gathered together to discuss Seder plays, how they were performed or, uh, and how one could perform them uh, in a contemporary setting. And at the time uh, I was living out in Los Angeles and you know, there were a lot of uh, theories about, oh, well, there, it's sort of like vaudeville or whatever, but uh, I was living with Ben uh, Sherman and uh, Landon Marcus had just moved to town. And uh, so the only people I was socializing with were LA rock people and they seemed kind of satery and that was kind <laughs> of it. I, we sort of discovered that the only one that exists is Cyclops. Mm. Uh, and kind of from there, I, I think Jay said that he had been reading the Odyssey and we kind of started work like the next day. So you guys had a familiarity with, uh, with Greek uh, myth um, and then you heard about the Seder play and you actively investigated. You're like, this no. is something I want to know more about. Yeah, I had literally just closed the last page of the Odyssey, just having moved out to L.A., New York, you know, starting this whole kind of fantasy American life. And um, Chaz called me up the next, hey, you want to do a musical about Cyclops? I was like, <laughs> well, <laughs> why, yes, I do, Chaz. <laughs> so, I, uh, I'm perfectly ready. Um, I mean, what was it that, that really attracted you to it? Was it sort of the, the obscurity? Was it the sense of play and strangeness about it? Um, what about the sort of Cyclops figure in this and the Seder play really drew you in? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was a, it sort of was the obscurity of it. Um, we had, I, I started a theater company out in LA with a, a friend, uh, Louis Butelli, who, um, and we'd kind of done a show out there over the summer called The Tale Told by an Idiot, which was like a, uh, based on the Shakespeare Scottish play. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing sort of seemed like, you know, it didn't want to be Shakespeare, but it probably wanted to be something else in the classical realm. And this sort of seemed to check off a bunch of those boxes and it was weird and unusual. And I hadn't seen a lot of Greek theater that had really uh, kind of uh, shook me in, in an emotional way. Okay. So I, I, that, and that was kind of really the impetus behind it. I mean, one of the things about this play that that you know that scholars, of course, love is its deep engagement with the Odyssey, and others love the fact that we have it because there's this idea that the Seder play is what tragedy was at the beginning, right? Huh. Um, which is, you know, who knows what you can say about that. Um, but one of the things I love about it is it's yet another example to think about Polyphemus, right? And one of the things that people often forget is that outside of the Odyssey, um, the Cyclops isn't a bad figure, right? In Hesiod's Theogony, the Cyclops is a helpful figure who's helping his Hephaestus. Um, and then we get the Cyclops and Theocritus and other poets as this like sympathetic figure who's in love with Galatea, but can't join her because he doesn't know how to swim. So how much of sort of being attracted to the play was, was that figure, the Cyclops, uh, too? Jay, why don't you take uh, that? Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote most of the show before I was cast as Polyphemus, <laughs> by the director who insisted that it was me all along. Um, and, you know, and then I suddenly was like, wow, he was right, it was me. Um, but when it, the character really started to open up and come alive and speak to me was when I did access some of those other myths, um, Asus and Galatea, mm -hmm. which I, in the full version of the show, which you won't see today, um, I kind of weird Al Yankovic a couple of songs from Handel's um, opera. Um, and we have, you know, Galatea and there's more of a, a, a mingling of those myths in the full version of this show. Um, so that, that was when he really opened up when he, his heart came through, which I think what you were just saying, Joel, um, in, in uh, the Cyclops story, Euripides, he's kind of a one dimensional figure in some way. Um, the angry Cyclops man-eating monster. But when you go outside of that realm and, and discover him in all of you know, the larger world of mythology, uh, you really do see uh, a more 
you know, a more you know, three-dimensional uh, figure. And I, I think he, he, he started to speak to me at that point when I discovered him there. And I think part of, you know, part of that, that, uh, that tradition, I think your intuition is going along with tradition, you know, with recent reimaginings of Homer and myth, right? Yeah. Giving the villains of the other side their voice. Carl, how's your audio? I um, hope yeah, it's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just <laughs> randomly turned off without me touching anything. So um, hopefully that won't happen again. It, uh, we pissed off Poseidon. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, so we'll take a few minutes and talk more to call at the end, but you guys stay on for a minute. I'm going to embarrass Carl while he's embarrassed enough. Um, Carl, we've known each other for 25 years, right? I slept um, over your house when you were 14 years old. Right. I, <laughs> that sounds stranger than it's supposed to. Right? <laughs> uh, but way back when we were both in Miss, uh, you know, Mrs. Baldwin's Latin class and you convinced me to write Latin profanity on the blackboard, um, <laughs> Did you know you were going to study Seder plays? Definitely not Seder plays. Uh, this is a truly embarrassing fact, but I did not know Seder drama existed until I got to graduate school. Um, I, I just didn't even know, it. yeah, there was any such thing um, as, an, as an undergrad even. I knew I wanted to teach yeah. at, at that early age, but that was about it. So don't be embarrassed. I think I'm with you. I remember opening like the OCT, just randomly flipping through it, I'm like, what the F is this, <laughs> right? This is amazing, which unfortunately is how most of my scholarly life has been. <laughs> like, this is weird, I wanna know more, right? Um, so we can get some more background after the performance, Carl, but um, I want a word from each of you who are on the screen. What, what are you looking for in a performance of the Cyclops? What are a few, in a few words, Carl, when you see this play, what, what do you look for? I think the hardest thing about Seder drama is figuring out the tone to strike, particularly in regard to humor. Um, it feels like a very subjective um, sort of thing. It's not as clear cut as comedy. Um, it's sort of, it's related to tragedy in very meaningful ways, but it's also comical and related to comedy and coma song in very meaningful ways. Um, and it's a, uh, scholars in general, I think, get up in arms about the tone that is struck, um, arguing either that it's too comical or too tragic. And um, I don't have a particular stance, but I think that's the thing that excites me the most to see um, just kind of the, the direction, particularly with humor um, that, that it will be taken in. Awesome. Uh, Chess, what would you ask for someone to look for? Um, well, in the similar way to what Jay said about how Galatea kind of uh, exploded things for him in terms of figuring out what the story was. Um, I think one of those things that's sort of interesting about uh, the way the Greek trage tragedians uh, uh, explored the Trojan War is, is in their kind of antipathy to whether or not they were really on the right side. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the, in the case of Odysseus, someone who, you know, at, by the time Euripides and Sophocles were writing about him, he was sort of a, a roguish, figure and, and almost a villain himself. And I think there's a lot of tension in the play about between the Cyclops and Odysseus as to who, who is the real villain in this world. And are they kind of to the flip, the flip of, the, of the coin on, uh, with each other? In this space, we're perfectly happy with Odysseus being a villain. Good, good. He, he is a villain. Yeah, he's a <laughs> terrible human being. Yes. Terrible. Jay. First him, yes. What are you looking for? Um, I Most of all, I mean, We've had quite a time putting this together on the technical aspect, as you can imagine. Um, turns out putting on Zoom musicals is not a walk in the park. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as with every performance we've done of it in the past and are hopefully have captured on film, just the raw visceral energy that might have been what, it, what the original intent of the uh, Seder genre, it would have been, right? The, just the the impact, the, the ability of it to kind of communicate with you on an emotional level through the performances and the, um, the words and the music and all that kind of bubbled together um, into some alchemical feeling, right? That transcends um, your daily humdrum life on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll see how we did. <laughs> that's one thing, you know, week by week we've talked about our Zoom craft and sort yeah. of taking it up a notch. And this is going to be our 
Uh, well, if there was a 10, we're now going to be at 11. Take it to them. Right. Thanks, you guys. So, <laughs> Carl, just, just to get the audience, where are we at the beginning of this play? What's um, the setting? Uh, the setting is um, Euripides has sort of updated Homer, Homer's version of Odyssey 9 a touch by updating it to Sicily. Um, and you have to sort of imagine what the audience would know and what wouldn't they wouldn't know um they would definitely know this myth this is one of the really fascinating things about the cyclops is that unlike most plays that we have from ancient greece it's actually overshadowed by its uh, original version whereas usually it's the tragedies themselves that are the versions that are copied and imitated in various ways um, so for an audience member um a couple things to keep in mind um they're Thucydides had already linked the Cyclopes with, with Sicily. Um, if we're correct with our performance date of like 412, 408, this is actually shortly after Athens had suffered a crushing defeat in Sicily. So there are some interesting historical things going on here being mapped on um, with potential uh, Athens as Odysseus, um, the Sicilians as the Cyclopes. Um, and definitely all of the background to the myth, the cave, the boulder, all of these things would have been, um, you know, just sort of ingrained in the minds of the Athenians. Um, and sort of the last thing that I'll point to is the, um, the fact that, and maybe I, you've said this when I was, my audio was gone and I was trying to reboot my computer. Um, every, every year at the city Dionysia, there were three days in which the tragedians performed. There were three tragedies and they always followed it up with a satyr play. So there's a real element of repetition here when you have um, the, when you, when you sit down and you've just watched three tragedies, you know what's coming. You know Silenus is going to be a character and you know there's going to be a chorus of satyrs. Um, so Euripides is really toying with that knowledge um, in his play. Awesome. Um, and Ben, you, you went out for a minute and came back. Do you have any final words before we get started? Um, I just, I hope everyone enjoys what we, we put together. Um, I know, I, I know I, I haven't seen the full thing yet, but I, I think I'm going to, it's been kind of a heck of a year for everybody. And I know I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, we, we've done maybe, I don't know, this is probably the fourth or fifth production we've done of this. Um, and it's obviously not, <laughs> it's not on a stage so it's been uh it's been kind of an interesting wrap up for uh 2020 for me and uh i just i want to thank Chaz and, and jay for for inviting me to do it again and uh <laughs> it, it, it like it's just it's it's interesting to see it come back in in 2020 because uh yeah. mm -hmm. you know <laughs> hopefully we can do it again in uh, in person sometime but uh i think the final product is uh going to be pretty cool. <laughs> so I'm I, excited. I dare say 2000 years in the Cyclops never goes out of style. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I agree. I don't, I don't know who presses play, but I think it's about time we go in that direction. <laughs> Oh, let's 
Friend, me friend, can you show me some clear water spring, the remedy of our thirst? Will anyone furnish with food my crew of mighty Greek seamen? I seem to be arrived at the blithe court of Dionysus. I observe this sportive band of satyrs near the cave. First, let me greet the elder. Hail. Hail, thou, a stranger. Tell thy country and thy race. I am the Ithacan king, Odysseus. Oh, I know the man. Worthy and shrewd. I am the same. But tell me, friend, uh, hast thou seen my companions? Uh, six or so in number, mighty Greek. Oh, no, no seamen here. None that we have seen. Really? I, I could have sworn they went... Whence uh, sailing did you come down to Sicily? From Ilion. And from the Trojan toils, the strength of Tempest bore us here by force. The self-same accident occurred to us. Oh, were, were you then driven here by stress of weather? Yes, following the pirates who had kidnapped Dionysus. That's how we ended up here. What land is this and who inhabits it? Etna, the loftiest peak in Sicily. And who possesses the land, the race of beasts? Cyclops, who lives in a cavern, not in houses. <laughs> <laughs> Obeying whom, or does the Cyclops govern himself? Nobody listens to nobody, no way. Nobody? Nobody. Nobody. Uh, does he sow the corn of Demeter? On milk and cheese, and on the flesh of sheep. Has he the Bromian drink from the vine stream? Ah, no, we live in an ungracious land. Well, is he just to strangers, hospitable? He thinks the sweetest thing a stranger brings is his own flesh. <laughs> what? Does, does he eat man's flesh? No one comes here who is not eaten up. <laughs> your, your master, the Cyclops now, where is he? Not at home. Absent on Etna, hunting with his dogs. Do you know a way out of here? No, Odysseus, but I'll help you any way I can. I need to find my crew. You will provide us food of which we are in want. Cow's milk there is, and a store of curdled cheeses. Well, bring out. I would see all before I bargain. How much gold will you engage to give? <laughs> I bring no gold. But barrels and casks of wine. Tis been a long time since these dry lips were wet with wine. But I can scarcely remember the day When me belly was pulled And me willy was pulled By those Dionysian nymphs Oh, how we play Then I came upon this wretched shore And Dionysus, he thrilled me no more My dear fellow, my chew, be a friend, put my thirsty elbow right, and let me drink again. <laughs> the great god Dionysus gave it to me, whom I had nursed as a little baby. Have you it now, or is it stashed on your ship? 
old man. Mm, this skin contains it. <laughs> this would hardly be but a mouthful to me. Nay, I have fountains beyond what you see. Say, come, my dear fellow, put talk to an end. Put my elbow right and let me drink again. La da da, la da da, la da da. from one friend to another. We've heard stories of the war and mm -hmm. city, Troy, and that woman, Helen. Did you take them? <laughs> <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've sacked the whole of Priam's household. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that, boys? <laughs> he, he sacked the city. <laughs> Did you... Uh, Sack Helen, then too? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just told you we sacked the whole. <laughs> what? 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 So nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Helen, though, she's the, the reason the Greeks uh, bang through the Trojan walls, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, there were myriad reasons for the Trojan War. The, the gods demanded we fight. Our honor and nationhood were at stake, uh, respect for Greek borders tariffs and shipping rights and oh but that wanton wretch helen no, no i just told you she was bewitched to see many colored anklets and a chain of woven gold which girt the neck of paris wasn't she and so she let that little guy menelaus poor little fellow oh there should be no more women in the world but such as reserved for me alone it reminds me of a song uh, <laughs> i have more on my mind than song and dance you are misled and the war was honorable and just and necessary now, where are the sheep and goats, good Salinas? Unsparing cheese of pressed milk. Take them. Depart with what Godspeed you may. Uh, first, leaving my reward, the Dionysian Jew of joy inspiring grapes. <laughs> what was that? Ah, me? Alas, what shall we do? Polythemus is at hand. Old man, we perish. Whither can we fly? Hide yourselves, quick, uh, within that hollow rock. Oh, for perilous to fly into the net. The cabin has recessed numberless. Hide yourselves, quick. That will I never do. The mighty Troy would be indeed disgraced if I should fly one man. How many times have I withstood with shield immovable? Ten thousand Trojans. If I needs must die, yet will I die with glory. If I live, the praise which I have gained shall yet remain. <laughs> what is this tumult? <laughs> Dionysus is not here. Speak, I'll beat you until you rain tears. And do look upward, not downward when I speak to you. Oh, master, see, I gave upon Zeus himself. Well, is my dinner fitly cooked and laid? Already, if your throat is ready too. <laughs> Only pray don't swallow me. Well, where are they? Where are my beautiful cheeses? Hmm. This stranger ate them. What? How dare he? Does he not know I am a god, sprung from the race of heaven? 
I, I told him so, but he ate all of your delicious cave eggs, artisanal cheeses, in spite of all I said. All of my delicious cabbage artisanal cheeses? Yes, all of your succulent cave aged artisanal cheeses. Liar! Could Cyclops hear my honest tale? This old Salanus gave me in exchange the cheese for wine, which I provided, the which he took and drank. There is no word of truth in what he says. I? May you perish, wretch. My darling little Cyclops, if I speak false, those who most I love, my children, perish wretchedly. Who this? <laughs> Stop! I saw him offering the delicious cave-aged artisanal cheese party platter to the stranger. If I speak false, then may my father perish. But do not thou wrong hospitality. Hospitality! Hospitality! Great offspring of the ocean, King, spare thy friends who visit thee, and place no impious food within thy jaws. For in the depth of Greece, we have upreared temples to thy great father Poseidon. Mm. Turn to converse under human laws. Receive us shipwrecked suppliants, and provide food, clothes, and fire, and hospitality. What does a soldier know of hospitality? It means ah. you can welcome a guest and not eat them. Troy's <laughs> wide land has widowed Greece enough. If you should roast the rest, tis a bitter feast that you prepare, for where then would any turn? Let me advise you, do not spare a morsel of all his flesh. If you should eat his tongue, you would become most eloquent, O Cyclops. <laughs> Wealth, my good fellow, is the wise man's god. All other things are pretense and boast. Stranger, I laugh to scorn Zeus's thunderbolt. For those who complicate with laws of man, I freely give them tears for their reward. I will not cheat my soul of its delight or hesitate in dining upon you. And that I may be quit of all demands, these are my hospitable gifts. Fierce fire and yon ancestral cauldron, which your oh, bubbling shall finally cook your miserable flesh. Creep in. <laughs> I smell the blood of a stranger. Cyclops, let this end. Let me leave with my men. Stranger, don't you realize the danger? <sighs> Never again see the face of a friend. <sighs> the only smile you'll see is from a monster like my me. Men. Cyclops, what have you done with them? You're cruel and vicious, release us now from your den. Stranger, you too will meet a similar end. They were delicious, if I had three wishes, I'd eat them again and again and again. Oh no, you'll never live to see another monster like me. Hey, you little twit. Can't you smell the shit until you're in it? Ask once again, and I'll release your men from my rear end. I burned the brains till the thoughts remained. Peeled the flesh as the gasp for breath. Roasted the thighs and sucked out eyes. Tossed the bones in my catacombs. Sizzled the liver, I saved you a sliver. Tis so nice, won't you have a slice? I dance the bass of the red beans of rice. As I wiped their remains from my great cutting board, I strung up their veins for my harpsichord. Stranger, could you be a monster like me? We're rather alike, us two. And nothing at all like you. Tell that to your victims at Troy, to every little innocent golden boy. <laughs> We fought to rid the world of a tyrannical king Our sacred duty Let freedom ring <laughs> It's been many 
that moon since I'm trying to roam Why you wander so far from your home? Afraid of the darkness that lurks inside Of the monster that you'll never find To burn in the light and turn in the night Pawn of the breeze to wander the seas Yes, you'll always be Yes, you'll always be A monster like me A monster like me A monster like me First, a toast Toast uh, To us monsters To us monsters May we get May we get what, what we deserve. deserve Your terrible host Well yeah, And I'm a lonely imposter So <laughs> here's a toast Monster. Well, well, I suppose I could have one of those It might be fine As I sit to dine To all the terrible hosts You know, lonely imposter Here's a toast To us monster Here's a toast To us monster Here's a toast It's too late to be a hero here, friend. Your mighty Greek seamen are all gone. <laughs> <laughs> And I fear you weren't worth much of a hero where you came from either. <laughs> Why waste such little time you have left on such follies? Because mm. I have a wife at home who awaits my return. There are people who love me yet. Can you say the same, Cyclops? <laughs> the wine has fascinated him. Yes, and I filled him cup after cup until the drink has warmed his entrails. My device is subtle. Ah, oh, then. I heard of old thou wert wise. <laughs> wise? I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, known before all men for the study of crafty designs, and my fame goes up to the heavens. When vanquished by the Dionysian juice he sleeps, there is a trunk of olive wood within, whose point having made sharp with this good sword, I will conceal it in fire and fix it burning yet within the socket of the Cyclops' eye and melt it out with fire. Ah! Joy! Joy! I am mad with joy at your device! <laughs> and then with you, my friends, we'll load the hollow depth of my black ship and row with double strokes from this dread shore. Ah! Oh, I would lift a hundred wagon loads if, like wasp's nest, I could scoop the eye out of the detested cyclops. <laughs> ah! Well then, let's get to it! Oh! But, um... Oh. What? Oh, listen not to him, Odysseus. Always fretting our Maron. Young Seder, if you have something on your mind... What happens if the Cyclops doesn't pass out? Hmm. He does have a point, Salinas. The Cyclops is a sizable creature. You leave that to me, Odysseus. <laughs> leave that to me. I know exactly what to do. You're certain? Yes. Yes. Nothing to worry about. If you're sure. Of course. Now, if there's nothing else. Right. Uh, now, let us... Oh! Uh, I like us, Maron. Go ahead, son. What if Polyphemus calls to his brother Cyclops for help? Did you say brother Cyclops? As in more than one? Oh. Yes. The caves here are all populated by members of the Cyclopean race, uh, but they're a lazy group and hardly ever... Uh... How many? Oh, just a few dozen. Uh, dozen? Don't worry, they're an unruly bunch and hardly ever socialize. And did the Cyclops call to them for help against me? As I said, Odysseus, nobody here listens to no one, no way. Nobody? What is that even... Well, unless anyone else has any... Yes, go ahead, Marin. <laughs> oh. 
Listen, O Cyclops, for I am well skilled in Dionysus, whom I gave you to drink. I gulped him down with great delight. <laughs> this is a god who never injures men. Uh, how does the god like living in a skin? He is content wherever he is put. God should not have their bodies in a skin. <laughs> if he gives you joy, what is his skin to you? I hate the skin. But I love the wine within. <laughs> well, stay here. Now drink and make your spirit glad. No, no, no. Ah, I've had enough. But ah. there's so much wine left to drink. How oh, now? He got what a delicious gold. Yes, you'll take it. Bread. Pour the wine for my cup. The wine is well accustomed to my hand. Pour out the wine, you insolent man. I pour, only be silent. I can't hear myself think. Silence is a hard task to he who drinks. Take it and drink it off. Leave not a drink. Put your elbow right and drink and drink again. Oh, that the drinker died with his own draft. Papai, the wine is a sapient plant. If you eat much after a mighty feast, moisten your mouth. Well, you will sleep. May I feel enough Dionysus drives you up. Oh, I can scarce rise, I am. Guest, tell how art thou my name is nobody. His, His name, name is nobody? Were you always so exquisitely bored? <laughs> We're the best of buddies. They're the best of buddies. And now that you've enjoyed my wine, uh, what favors? Will you grant to me? Hmm. When I next sit down to dine, I'll savor the flavor. I'll take my time. And if I should place my hand upon thine, yeah. I'll save you for later. That is my favor, I'll feast on you last mm -hmm. before it. my feasting stops. You grant your guest a fair <laughs> reward. <laughs> oh, so.
out to sin the hell. When sweet music singing in the air, tell me what world is falling upon me. When sweet music singing again, but I had it nothing, stinky not to flee. You just can't catch what your eye can't see. On me, on me, my eye can't see. <laughs>
roughly escaped Or are they yet within? My eye has been raped Help me find them I know not where to begin <laughs> They stand under the rock Away from the light At my left or my right On your right Where? Over there There? Very near. They're, They're frozen in fear. Not there. Where? Over here. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Ah. I'm mocked by a feeble goat. <laughs> I'm gonna eat you all before you get to your boat. Because I'm a cyclone. So when I was a kid, every time Star Wars would end, I would cry because I didn't want it to be over. And that's the feeling I have right now. Um, so before I say anything else, I want to thank Chaz, Ben, Landon for making this thing reality. And we'll get to you guys in a minute, but um, that was amazing. Um, so Carl, some first responses. What are you feeling right now? Uh, that was uh, absolutely incredible. I am so sad that I'm only learning about this rock opera now. I don't know how. I wish Chaz had somehow reached out long ago and, and told me about it because this is, it, it, uh, it, it's an amazing thing to see and, um, and, and does just this like really incredible job of, of engaging with um, Euripides text in a way that I think Euripides probably would appreciate. Yeah, right. Like if we if we had the power of Dionysus and the frogs, and we could go to the underworld and dig up old Euripides, um, I think he'd be all on board with this one, right? But let's get to that. I want to get to that point though. Why this works by tracing us back, right? Um, so let's go back to what a Seder play is. You know, so we talked a little bit about how it's in a weird space. Where does it come from, and where did it go, Carl? Yeah, well. 
um, satyrs were in the popular imagination of the Greeks well before um, drama even existed. So um, you have, we have uh, vases that depict performances of satyrs, satyrs in mythological settings. Um, and there's something about satyrs that just is inherently linked to performance, it seems. Um, something about their liveliness, their dance, their singing, their connection to Dionysus and wine and partying and song and all of that. Um, so we, we have evidence, pretextual evidence um, of satyrs in various contexts, including performative contexts. Um, so satyr drama itself didn't develop until around the end of the sixth century. But um, before that, we know that people were dressing up like satyrs, processing, through the streets, um, getting pulled in, in carts in the shape of ships with Dionysus. Um, they made huge floats that were carried on the shoulders of six men with a giant satyr riding a giant phallus pole. Um, there's, there's something just, um, yeah, very, I don't know. It, it, it's so ridiculous. It's, I, think, I think the connection to Centaurs is maybe a useful place to think about it. Centaurs and satyrs are obviously very similar creatures, both man, both part man, part horse. But centaurs in Greek myth and imagination are very threatening creatures. Um, satyrs, however, are constantly interested in sex, but never achieving it. Constantly interested in carousing, drinking, dancing. And um, there's something about that carefree nature that certainly would play into um, you know this festive time of year in in Athens and elsewhere in Greece. So playful creatures constantly interested in sex and carousing it sounds like you're describing teenagers. Right? <laughs> um, yeah they they I mean it's they're there are definitely connections. I mean, there are um, legal treatises where, um, where teens are, are mentioned as being the Ithophaloi, which <laughs> means, you know, constantly erect. It's like gangs of teenagers who would make fun of people and tease them and basically call themselves satyrs. So, um, I mean, in part, they then represent sort of both liminal and transitional characters and spaces. Um, can you, I mean, I know you've probably asked about this a lot and think about it a lot, um, but how does then this thing of a Seder play gets, get connected to the, tra the trilogy of tragedies? Well, my personal theory is that tragedy started up and um, immediately was probably a pretty major success, but tragedy, inherently the tone of it um, is more serious. Hmm. The Greeks had numerous pre-comic performances, various styles of performance that um, were humorous. People would dress up as animals, um, you know, lots of, of opportunities for, um, for humor. And they wanted to create a genre of performance that was like tragedy, um, that was theatrical. And they latched on to satyrs perhaps because the festival was in honor of Dionysus and satyrs were the companions of Dionysus and they were comical figures. Um, but the downside is if you have every play after the three tragedies every year be satyrs, you're missing out on lots of other opportunities for comedy. And that's why, again, my theory at least, comedy was formulated in 486, about 15 years after satyr drama. You know, after 15 years of satyr plays, they were like, you know, we could actually have lots of different comical performances that don't include the satyrs. Uh, and I mean, what's fascinating about this one then is adding Silenus and the satyrs to the Cyclops scene and in something that's a, a pretty uh, um, conventional and, and standard replication of that scene from the Odyssey, right? There are some variations, um, but various things like saying, I'll eat you last, like the nobody trick, although in the text, they skip that bit of going from Utis to Matis to like make uh -huh. it extra uh -huh. special fun. Um, but I mean, I could see what you're saying. Like how many times can you just take a normal scene and throw satyrs in it and see what happens, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it took 15 years for the meme to die, <laughs> but then they did something else. So um, you were saying, you started out by saying, you know, 
tonally, Euripides probably would have enjoyed this, right? So what are some things about this play, uh, about this performance and this interpretation of the Cyclops that you think are sort of Euripidean in spirit? Well, I think the main thing is, and this is maybe just a broader point, um, people are typically exposed to ancient Greek dra drama in textual form. You read it in, in class or um, you know, you're exposed to it in that way, but the Greeks did not ever think of these as texts to be read. They were thinking of them as a single performance. And, you know, it was outlawed to put on repeat performances. So this was written, composed, um, directed, organized, every element of it, Euripides was sort of in touch with, um, with pushing and, and directing in the way that he wanted. And I think that another piece that like makes a, makes a big difference is um, Greek just had a lot fewer words and a lot way, fewer ways of expressing itself. And so when people see, you know, it, famously people who really want to link Seder drama with tragedy will say, well, we have these fragments and we don't even know. It could be a tragedy or it could be a Seder drama. And that's absolutely true, except in a performance, you have the Seders there and they undercut all of that tragic tone. And so, um, you know, I really loved the way that um, Odysseus is sort of, you know, using this uh, archaic tone. And then you've got, um, you know, in fact, one of the satyrs really, uh, while he bod, I mean, it just sounded like Beavis and Butthead to me. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was really great um, the way that it's, the, you know, to take that archaic tone and undercut it with the satyr's presence. Um, and the biggest thing is really just this, this, this demonstrates, I mean, if you, I were handed a text of the Cyclops, the rock opera, it just wouldn't be able to do justice to the actual performance. And I think that Euripides would be pretty shocked to be thinking about, you know, 2,400 years later, somebody who's sitting down and reading the text of the Cyclops, um, because to him and to the Athenians, it was that performance that made, it was the heart of it. And I, I feel like that heart of, of performance, it was just, it was crucial and extremely well executed. Right, and I mean, we lose so much just reading the transcript, right? We lose the, the, the occasionality and the context you're talking about, but also the music, right? Which, and the dance and movement, which is so crucial to ancient performance. And in this one, you know, before we were talking about some of the characterization of Odysseus as a villain and being sympathetic to um, Polyphemus. What I find fascinating their casting though, is, you know, it, they start out with the Cyclops as a monster and Odysseus is a straight up like Zac Efron sort of character, right? <laughs> Right. Um, so why don't we start bringing the performers back in, Carl, because I know you have some questions uh, about how they created the text and came to what they have. So Ben, Jay, Chaz, uh, Rob, do you, you want to join us? <laughs> so so uh, again, uh, thank you for doing something yes. wonderful and beautiful. Um, Carl, <laughs> you want to start off? I know you had a question. Did you say Carl? Sorry, I missed it. Yeah, Carl. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was curious, um, I guess, uh, Rob, since you, uh, according to the website, you worked from um, Shelley's translation. Is that true? Like, how did you, like, what kind of research went into the, your own composition? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think, I, it's- Oh, I guess, yeah, it's, sorry. No, sorry. No, no, no worries. <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> I mean, we're going back like 10 years now, but my, my memory is sort of that uh, I, I looked it up on Wikipedia that there was kind of a, a, a list at the time of the available translations. And um, there were a number of ones that were contemporary and then uh, and the language was sort of modernized. But um, I, the I, you know, I, love, I love Shelley, I love Lord Byron, you know, those guys and um, there's such an association with Greece already. Um, and uh, I, I, there was like a PDF of it online. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, what, did, like, did you, did you, I don't know, it just felt like you, um, I don't know, captured it so well. I, I, it felt like more must have gone into it than just sort of like, I'm going to take this text and make a rock opera. Yeah, I, I mean, I, kind of, a, there, there are parts of it that are already in verse, I, you know, I mean, m much of it's in verse, but uh, there's, I think I think it started with essentially me pulling apart 
the, the first song in the show uh, for your gaping gulf is uh, like, I think it was just a passage in the Shelley um, translation. And I think I just handed it off to Jay and was like, why don't you see what you can do with this? Um, and we kind of went from there and just kind of picked it apart, found the places that seemed uh, like they were musical moments, um, you know, parts that seemed to have the most action or the most kind of emotion to them, but then also the parts that seemed the most poetic. So, I, and then kind of from there, trimming away at, at the text to make it as sort of, you know, give it, give it some flow at least. So when thinking about the, so the process then of sort of creative choosing the moments of the song and then creating the songs, I'd love to hear more about, um, you know, before we even came on live, we were joking about, you know, bands I don't like, right? Um, <laughs> and other music, right? But I heard a lot of different influences uh, in, in the songs, right? I mean, uh, there's some David Bowie in there, some prog rock going on. When you go to the waltz in that area, I was like, whoa, what are we doing here? And then, you know, you get this sort of a country ballad that turns rockabilly for the for the Cyclops. Um, are you just going through your favorite music? Um, or did you sort of have a, you know, a symphonic idea of how to tell the story? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> well, I think that the text really dictated for me the, the mood of the music, the, the, the needs of the music, what it would have to do. I mean, that part you referenced, you know, the monster, like, needs, ah, scary, ah, I'm going to eat you. And then for Odysseus, that's really like a Hail Mary moment, right? He has to kind of suddenly have this genius, this, uh, you know, uh, Athena driven revelation. Oh, hey, hey, here's a toast to us monsters, right? So it seemed like I had to switch completely the genre, the mood, the, the vibe, right? And it's really his character that does it, the, his, uh, his, you know, cunning that is gonna like say, I know, I'm gonna throw a country, uh, you know, <laughs> Texas waltz upbeat number, dance house number at him. He'll never see that coming, right? <laughs> well, how <laughs> I, I just laugh there because, you know, when I used, lived in Texas for nine years and when I <laughs> used the Odyssey up here, I say, you know what happens if you come home in Texas and someone's sitting on your couch and eating your food and drinking your beer, <laughs> you just get to shoot them. That's, right? <laughs> That's okay. That's um, okay. So no, I just fascinated. Like, so, I mean, so how much uh, of it was just like what song, what style feels right? Yeah. I mean, I, and then there's some moments, I think I, I was, we're really looking for clues in the text. Um, and there were some moments like that were hidden, that kind of alluded to, I think Shelley had uh, almost a more um, reserved kind of Victorian translation of this play, right? So some things like the, the some of the gags, some of the satyr gags, the sodomy kind of whole bit that we do um, was a little more nuanced in the Shelley. And I saw that and I was like, let's just boom, we're gonna blow that up, right? And um, <laughs> so it was like, what is he really, what is he hiding here? You know, I want to, I want to dig that up. I want to open that up and get in there. So, <laughs> yeah. So what was the process like of the adaptation? So we talked about Chaz and, and Jay, you, you went that way. Um, Rob, do you want to talk about being Silenus, Silenus in, in that performance? Yeah, well, it's just, <laughs> it was great fun. Got to take my shirt off and do some acting. Um, you know, it's been um, it's been really good for me because I'm I'm not so I come at this not from a particularly academic standpoint, as in I'm not as well versed in these uh, classics as as you guys are. So I I really valued the kind of accessibility of it. You know, I've actually been uh, sort of very much interested in uh, mythology and all that, but somehow turned off some a little bit by the the kind of um, the distance that some of the text can can create. I mean, I'm a sort of classic actor, muso guy and a musical theater guy. Whereas this, I was just like, oh yeah, I get it. I get it. I get what I need to do. And it needs to be big. And it needs to be loud. And it needs to be expressive. And it needs to be sensual and sexual and mischievous. And uh, I felt from the guys in, in our emails and, and things, just like, let's just play. And they were very open and just were like, look, you run with it and just, you know, do what, what feels right. And that, that was cool because I think you can get a little bit... Um, sort of almost intimidated by like, you know, really what is the text doing and are you being true to all these various elements? For me, it, it just was very visceral and it just kind of leapt off with the songs, just kind of gave it a life that felt very uh, natural to me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I had a lot of fun. And, and I think you, you put it there well. I mean, it, we have this 
uh, admittedly false view of classics in the ancient world, right? That it's, you know, high culture, high register. Um, and this this play has a lot of, you know, like any comedy, it's a lot of defecation um, and there's drunken goat screwing. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that, I mean, maybe that's high register for some. Right? <laughs> um, so one of the things we've been talking about all, all semester, semester, all year, um, <laughs> is the difference of bringing something as big and loud as this into this small space. Um, so what, what was the experiences like in recording it and making it small uh, um, as compared to performing it live on stage? So Ben, when you performed it live on stage, um, did you play live um, in rock opera style? I think you, I think Ben froze. Yeah. The answer is yes. <laughs> Go for it, Ben. Yeah, no, the whole thing just froze. What, what was the question? Oh, I, I mean, so what, what was it like performing it live with the instruments while playing as opposed to doing what you did to make this video? Um, it was a lot of fun, but it was never the same way twice because there was always a lot of limitations about um, us wanting to be a you know huge band and to be really loud me in particular <laughs> um, uh, but the size of the stages were always kind of small so th this was great because we could i could go over the demos uh and jay sent me stuff and i could send back and forth and he'd say no that doesn't work or that does work and i could fix stuff and it was great to have the opportunity to like really dial it in as opposed but you know the magic of there's nothing like the magic of the live show and the cyclops live show was always different but always a lot of fun and i think the audience also really always enjoyed it too so so i noticed in all the drinking scenes that the bottles were capped um when i was in high school i was in a theater production <laughs> of hair um in which people were smoking fake marijuana and some of the <laughs> 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 and so those uh, those performances varied one to one. When you did it live, um, how much did it differ from night to my, night based on sort of audience energy and um, consumption? And whether or not the the substances were real, right? Yeah. <laughs> we we were in our let's see mid twenties in L.A. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> substances were pretty answer. real. Oh, yeah. Sometimes equipment got damaged. Sometimes audience members got damaged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, really a lot of the a lot of the variability came down to everything being so new and us kind of building this thing on the fly which was like really exciting and fun and probably the time of my life as well but like that made it so that it wasn't necessarily like perfect every night and the same every night as opposed to like something that's been rehearsed 200 times you know yeah i think there was always kind of a uh an uncomfortable marriage between theater and rock show. And uh, I mean, uncomfortable in a great way. Like I think that that it, it felt like it straddled those lines uh, in a really fun way. But um, but there was a lot of chaos energy in that, on that stage every night. Yeah, yeah, Dionysus was actually a character in the original show. And he was really just, he'd go around and just, you know, kind of merry make. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but, yeah. Before I, Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, the, you know, the live show has the satyrs as a band on the stage, right? And so they're kind of interacting with them the whole time. They're in their old goat, you know, gear, and um, that was kind of like the thing that clicked it for me, coming from a rock background. You know, is that oh, okay, it's like a band, yeah, and we're on stage, and but there's this musical thing happening, you know, with a, a bunch of uptight actors and. Um, you know, we kind of get to mess with them and it's this playful back and forth. It was a rock show. We were on, on stage the yeah. whole time. It was like, it went from a one hour show to like a two hour show to an hour 45 minute show. The time <laughs> it kept changing, but we were, the band was on the stage the whole time. I mean, it was just, and then the actors would kind of go around and do this and that. We try to create stuff for them, <laughs> but it was, it was just, it was funny. It, it was a true, it was a rock show is what it, what it really was. So at the beginning, um, we were talking a little about things that were in that performance that didn't make this one. Yeah. Right? And so this one was fairly close to my hazy memory of, re of quickly rereading re um, Euripides' text. Um, what did you add to it? Um, and, and how did you make the decision to sort of build out the play? I, I think a lot of this stuff was, uh, you know, it went through trial and error. So there was some stuff that got added that then got taken out. Um, 
but uh, the, the stuff that you know, there was uh, expanded moments for for we I think we mentioned Galatea already. Um, there was a moment for Odysseus who had a couple songs that kind of about home, kind of a, a little more. Uh, new the I want, want songs. Yeah, I want songs. Yes. <laughs> uh, the satyrs have a few more songs uh, that kind of like explore their background, explore their connection to Dionysus, their connection to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, the Galatea line was kind of uh, sort of brought in, you know, another side to Polyphemus that, um, you know, it was kind of meant to show his Achilles heel in a way, right? Uh -huh. In the longer show, there was a lot more development of uh, Selenus, and there was a lot more uh, Cyclops songs. There, there's a lot of other songs that just aren't are in this. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of other songs that didn't make this cut, but I actually, this is my first time seeing it, and I thought it, the way it was cut and the way, the way the story flowed was really cool. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I was into this. So I, I think Chaz did an awesome job proof. editing this. I don't know how he did it. And right. I, I mean, mean the, the way that we conceived doing this whole thing on zoom and being able to play together on zoom we, we quickly decided that that was going to be pretty much impossible it's hard enough to just yeah. have a conversation on zoom <laughs> so Chaz came up with the idea of recording it and it was like all right well that's that's going to be the best way to do this and what's now your, we have paypal you know, ben yeah yeah <laughs> go ahead what's your paypal ben <laughs> what's your paypal <laughs> yeah uh so um a few more, just one sort of last general question. The past year has changed the way most of us do work and think about our craft. Um, how's it affected you guys as artists and how's that sort of led into what you did today? And I'll just, let's, let's go, let's go Chaz, Jay, Ben, and then Rob. Uh, Paul. Uh, we'll get to Paul. <laughs> He's there. Uh, yeah. You know, I, it, it's been challenging. Um, I mean, no one knows when theater's coming back or in what form. Uh, so um, I've, you know, tried to write as much as possible and tried to finish things that had been outstanding long projects and um, dusting this off with something. But uh, yeah, it's 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 tricky and it's hard, to, kind of hard to imagine what tomorrow's going to look like versus six months and nine months from now when they say theater is coming back. So uh, yeah, you know, it's it's you got to stay optimistic i guess um but it's definitely tricky to to just to find the motivation to to work every day yeah to get out of bed every morning yeah it's, <laughs> it's really tricky uh jay um yeah okay so this year has been a total drag it sucks not being able to go to the theater and you know put on shows and be with each other I, the pandemic is terrible my wife is a nurse shout out to all healthcare workers out there Woo! um you know, so we see the horrors of it up close, but I, I do think the silver lining is that we're being forced as artists to uh, go inward, to reinvent the way we do things, regenerate, and, and to, to see that we don't really need big institutions to make art. I mean, we can, we have the power to do it uh, ourselves and it, you know, okay, maybe it's not as expensive or fancy, but, um, <laughs> You know, I think it's it's bringing us back to a humble place of creation, uh, of original creation, to the source, close to the source of of inspiration. So I'm I'm hopeful, and I think it's just, this is sucks. It's like you know, it is what it is. But I think it's been really good for artists and for art overall. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm gonna agree with Jay. It 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 sucks, but um, <laughs> everyone being Everyone being at home is, you know, I've been able to play more, dedicate more time to learning guitar and relearning and adapting the songs and developing and fleshing out some of the songs. So that's been really great. Um, you know, I'm not, a, I don't, I don't make a day-to-day -day living as a guitar player. I wish I, I wish I could, but. Well, you need um, all those tools. But, <laughs> my my industry is totally decimated because i'm in the i'm in the live events av industry which is completely gone now obviously um but i've been home you know taking care of my four-month-old baby and i just have been able to focus on taking care of my family and working on this project so it's not going to be forever it's going to go back to 
you know, it, it'll be a, probably a few years before we can all, you know, be together as a family again. And all my family and Jay and Chaz, you guys are all on the East Coast. I'm out here in Oregon, for Christ's sake. So, <laughs> um, it's going to be a, a couple of years or maybe maybe next year or something. But, you know, as long as everybody stays healthy, we'll, we'll get through it. It's just it's been pretty brutal. But um yeah, I, you know, it's been good be, to be able to really have time to focus on my family and my newborn and my, the new, the new adaptation that we've done. So it's, I'm, 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 I'm thankful after it, after this insane year, that's, that's really all I can, that's, that's the best positive outlook I can come up with right now. <laughs> Thank you, man. Uh, Rob? Yeah, I think, um, I think Jay said it's so sort of humbling in a way. And I think it's, I, I mean, I've been a, a sort of, gigging musician and for years and at times i've got a bit bored of it you know and thought like oh man just singing songs with people like i don't know is anybody even really appreciating this anymore or whatever and and this year you're like oh yeah yeah they really they do and they miss it and i miss it and um i've actually done some live gigs recently outside some care homes without outdoors you know just in the car parks of care homes and it's like People are like, oh, my God, remember this? this yes, music being played by humans in a space. And and um, so I sort of come back to this real appreciation for for what it does for people, and what it does for communities and what it does for for, for human beings. Um, I hope that people appreciate what the industry. I mean, again, that's been touched on, like the industry side of it or the individuals who are just trying to create and like we're not all looking for massive record deals but everything's online now so i hope people don't get too used to everything just being free online all the time you know we're all doing i mean like Chaz has done an editing job that would have taken somebody you know days and days right. do you know what i mean so there's an element of it i feel protective of about as a sort of artist in the industry who wants but i'm hoping uh, that the main thing is that we go into a kind of roaring twenties from this point on that, that maybe from next summer or whatever, it's going to be, it's going to be like, uh, you know, this, this, this rock opera lived out in every street corner of the globe uh, for, for, for the oh, next no. 10 years. So I, that's, without I, the goats, maybe, maybe the goats will, will stay. Uh. Well, I like what you say. The, the idea, like people realize, Oh, we need this performance. And, you know, the recent novel by Emily St. John Mandel uh, station 11 tells a story of a traveling Shakespeare theater group post-apocalypse, like going around Canada and the Midwest and, you know, what it's like on both sides of those things. Um, Carl, this is your first time with us and with this rock opera. Um, what are you thinking about right now? I'm, I'm, I mean, after hearing about all of the sort of adaptations, both to the text, the opera, um, as well as sort of just your individual lives as artists, um, I'm sort of wondering about the future of the Cyclops as you see it in terms of performance and kind of, I presumably you don't, you'd never foresaw this kind of adaptation of the Cyclops, yet you did it. So um, uh, I'm kind of curious if, if you see more performances of Cyclops in your future or, or yeah, what, what the direction is going, if it was going anywhere. I, I would say, yeah, I definitely want to keep fleshing it out. I would love to expand this kind of recorded version and actually, you know, maybe with some more time to edit it and tweak it. And, um, but I'd love to bring it back live to the stage and, and bring it to Greece, to the home, to the motherland. Yeah. I, have to, I mean, that's I, always been our dream. Yeah. I, I really think um, I, so I saw a play at the Odeon, which is like on the hill of the Acropolis. It's like a Roman era theater. Um, and I went and saw a, like every summer um, under typical circumstances, of course, they put on um, in, there and both and in Apodavros, like performances of ancient plays in ancient Greek. Um, but I feel like so like I, I saw Aristophanes piece there. Uh, but I feel like this is kind of like a no brainer. You just have to get in touch with the right people and yeah. it'll happen. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> We've got another thing on our bucket list. Yeah. Right. right. And plans we'll have to make. So Paul, this is the first episode of this year you've been shirtless in. Um, <laughs> but not the last. <laughs> not next week. Yeah, I mean, where do I go from here? 
that that is true. Um, well, I mean, we Greece. can move the camera yeah. around, but yeah. we have to check, get off YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just want to say like a really huge thank you to to Jay and to Jazz and to Ben um, for kind of jumping in with this and just doing such an amazing job. Because I think one of the things that's been really lovely actually about this, and it's been a really lovely thing about the whole series is, and it kind of touches a bit of, on what we've been talking about in terms of what's it like sort of as someone who normally kind of just makes work in the theatre and sort of in music and things like that. What's it like kind of living in the world at the moment? But one of the things about this series has been meeting new people um, and finding new collaborations and actually the opportunity for like Rob and I do a, a lot of work together and, and he and I have worked on numerous shows over here and we've written a musical about ancient Greece and things like that. And now to kind of get to meet Jay and, and Chad and Ben as well is just really amazing. And I know that I definitely, definitely want to be in Greece when uh, when Cyclops, the rock opera, is on. <laughs> we'll, we'll just have to set the goats into some safe area. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. so, goats or harm during the production of this show. No, no. So, um, so you know, stage, yeah. in the Odyssey, the Cyclops, as you pointed out, someone who, who doesn't have a, a community, right? Who's alone in an island and not part of civilization. Um, and I felt that's been the danger all year for all of us, and sort of in our isolation, just giving out laws to our own families um, without connection with one another. Um, but you guys, thank you for, for bridging that gap tonight. Um, thank you, Paul, for making this happen. As many of you know, um, we've got one episode left this year. Next Wednesday, um, I think we're at 41, 42, I have no idea. We're going to do uh, Aristophanes Frogs. Um, so everybody break out your Breca Kekex Coox Coox. Come back next week at 3 p.m. EST, 8 p.m. GMT. I think I got that right this time. Um, and we'll all get together for, um, you know, the last time of this season. Um, so thank you to everybody tonight and to our amazing crew of producers who make this happen. Paul Omani, um, Amy Pistone, Emma, Lana, um, Keith, Ellen, Janet, Sarah, the entire squad from CHS, John Coley for his um, remarkable images. Uh, you know, Cyclops as a Kiss character, Kiss player is about <laughs> the cool. best thing I could ever <laughs> imagine. Ali for making the posters, Carl for coming back for coming here and joining us despite the fact that the internet tried to defeat him um, and everybody who's watching uh, stay safe take care uh, get vaccinated if you have the option and we'll see you next week